our next speaker is sure to bring a lot of fun and a lot of insights about authentic diversity, equity, and inclusion. I just wanted to extend a warm welcome to Darren Connolly Booksieb from the San Francisco Ballet. Come on up. Okay, good morning. No, it's not morning. Hello. <laughs> I am the HR director and the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion at San Francisco Ballet. Um, obviously, today we're going to be talking about flawless diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to use lessons from my cousin, Beyonce. Um, <laughs> You're laughing at that, that's very interesting. Okay? <laughs> I've only told you one lie so far and you think it was what you just laughed about. The one lie I told you initially is, is the flawless part, right? Because we're all on a journey together here in this diversity and equity and inclusion realm. And so we're not at that flawless point yet. But what are some lessons that we can learn from Beyonce, my cousin? <laughs> uh, um, that could help us strive further in this diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. So by way of the agenda, we're gonna go over an introduction. I'm gonna tell you why Beyonce not only is, is my cousin, but she's also me. Um, <laughs> then we're going to go into what separates us, what is blocking us from really having authentic, flawless diversity, equity, and inclusion principles, policies in our workplace, and outside of our workplace where it matters too. So what is that partition? You laugh because you're seeing the references that are in bold to each of Beyonce's hit songs that you all will dance to later on in this program. Yeah. Then, yes. <laughs> then we're gonna talk about getting into a diversity, equity, inclusion community, into a formation and what that means for each of us and what our responsibility is for us to get inside that formation. We'll then take a little sip of lemonade, because we're parched, I'm parched thinking about it. Um, and we're going to upgrade your, yes, I spelled your wrong. It's on purpose, okay? Because it's the song is Upgrade You. And how many people knew, how many people knew that? Are these all Beyonce fans in here? Oh, wow, I saw 10 people I'm going to talk to. And then, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about so getting into a DEI mindset, what that means, again, not just for our workplace, but for our personal lives as well. Then we'll move on to bring it home to our homecoming pep rally. And we'll talk a little bit about homecoming. I'm sure you've seen it on Netflix. If you haven't, you'll see a little bit of today. You'll stand up. You'll get your jive on. Um, sober, I know, but get your jive on. And then we'll talk about running the world for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and that's when we leave this room. What are we empowered to do to get closer to a flawless diversity, equity, and inclusion lens? I wanna start by giving a little bit of an introduction to myself and Beyonce. D and B, Bay, B, Bay, Beehive. First watch, it's really fun. Get it, get it. Look at my friends who can't dance. <laughs> my friends for life, but can't dance. Okay. Then the tall man comes in. He was late coming in. <laughs> so I think we got a good picture of my dancing ability. Um, thank you, thank you. So that was from our wedding. This is my husband, Mark. I like to give a little background about myself and one of the happiest aspects of my life is my life outside of work like many of you. Um, so this is from our wedding. We were married uh, almost three years ago. My father married us. He's very excited to be there. He's like, you finally found a good one. <laughs> I cried a lot because I'm a crybaby. We danced. I made everybody dance who was in that room after this video as well. Um, and then I want to go back here. 
So that's like a little bit of my story, why I like Beyonce, who I am right now. One other important element is that I work for a ballet organization. And when we think about ballet and we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we actually don't think about them in the same way, right? We have an image in our head when we think about a ballerina. We have an image in our head when we think about ballet. And I'm here to challenge that image. And I work at San Francisco Ballet to challenge that daily. It's very important work. We have representation from all over the world at San Francisco Ballet. Um, and I'm really trying to bring forth the Beyonce musical um, ballet. So if you want to help fund that, just talk to me <laughs> after this program. So I wanted to play. Maybe I messed it up, but I wanted to play the official trailer from Beyonce so that you can get a little bit of background on why we're doing this work with Beyonce. Just give me one second. In the meantime, who can tell me um, their favorite Beyonce song? What is it? A little louder. OK, you said all of them. Here you go. This is a choo-choo, okay, it's green. You get a choo-choo. Anybody else have a favorite song? Lemonade. Get me body. Okay, who's got get me body? Because that's the song there. I'm not gonna throw this because that's just a little bit difficult. And now I think this video is ready to play. I was stalling. Here you go, you take this too. And then, and then we'll play this. What I really want to do is be a representative of my race, of the human race. I have a chance to show how kind we can be, how intelligent and generous we can be. I have a chance to, to teach and, and to love and to laugh. And I know that when I finish doing what I'm sent here to do, I will be called home. And I will go home without any fear, uh, trepidation, so I'm wondering what's going to happen. But... And what advice would you have to give this generation? Tell the truth to yourself first and to the children. So Netflix did not pay me to um, show you that advertisement. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. But when we um, were asked to think about the first word that jumps to your mind when we talked about ballet, um, I want to ask the same question. The first word that comes to your mind when you think about Beyonce. And you can shout those words out so I can hear them. Wow. Flawless, stunning, iconic, committed, powerful, focused. Fierce. Did you say Virgo? <laughs> I had to do a double take on that one. I was like, yes, Virgo. <laughs> Any others? A couple more. Woman. Graceful, strong. Unapologetic. And unapologetically black, right? So when we first think about Beyonce, we don't instantly think black, and we don't instantly, except for one person here, said woman. And Kimberly Crenshaw's work, she talks a lot about intersectionality, and that's where I want to focus on a little bit. What I'm trying to get at through our work, from doing talent management, from doing HR, from doing compliance, and from just doing the general work in communities, is that intersectionality matters. And if we build programs and relationships and community with those who have often been left out, um, we stand to get to that flawless point of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right? If we look at our prison industrial complex, um, we see what? We see brown and black men and women are locked up at crazy rates. 
bigger than the rates of slavery itself currently. When we turn on CNN or Fox News or whatever it might be at night, we see that there are constant problems that are intersecting in our culture and in our workplace. So the days of us bringing our whole selves to work need to actually occur. But we also have to recognize that while we feel comfortable bringing our whole selves, others don't because of things that are happening in society. By focusing on Beyonce, a black woman, we'll look at how she practices strong allyship with the privileges that she has. She's rich. She's rich as hell, y'all. And, and I'm not. I'm not here, Beyonce, if you're watching this. Come on, hook me up. Um, but she uses her platform, literally her stage, to do activist work, especially as of recently, for black women and black and brown bodies. And I think that we can also model our programming, model our behaviors around what Beyonce does on a budget. <laughs> but this work is very important, so I've got to give you a warning about the work. Right? Once you've heard about it, once you know um, that there is an issue, that there is an issue that brown and black folks are facing, that there's an issue for oppressed groups that they're facing, that there's an issue of discrimination at your workplace, where some of you may want to raise your hand and talk about it. I welcome you to after when the cameras are turned off and your boss doesn't find it. But <laughs> the, with this work, we have to know you can't unsee, you can't unhear what you're about to learn. And some of you have learned it already, but these skills and tactics have sit dormant. And we've got to remember through lessons from Beyonce to keep them up. Otherwise, we'll never get to the point of flawless diversity, equity, and inclusion. On a cultural competency model, there are four main areas of talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion work. I want to be very clear that the focus of today's session will all be in action and advocacy. So what can we take with us what can we do for ourselves and for others in the community and in our workplaces and for those who apply for jobs at our workplaces that um, actually changes outcomes? So getting into the DEI partition, what is keeping us back from diversity, equity, and inclusion and getting to it in a flawless manner? Um, number one, we are terrified of naming the problem. There's multiple reasons for that, because of power dynamics in the workplace, power dynamics in society, just being plain old tired of having to name it and then being told what you're naming is not adequate, not right, not true. I'm not racist, right? So that just solves everything when I say that and I tell you about my one black friend. And then, OK, yeah, you're not racist. I'm so proud of you. We've got to actually name the issue. We've got to call it out by what it is, and people may be offended by that. Um, but call it out in a way that people can hear it. Be courageous in your conversations, but be persistent and consistent about calling it out. We have to move beyond a point of not being the not, right? So oftentimes, like I said, we know that person when we're on public transportation, and they come up to you and they're like, girl, your hair is laid. Let me, let me touch it. Ah. Uh -huh. See, I don't even laugh. I'm like, get out of my face. And, and they, you know, they want the different textures, different. You know, I just want to touch it. I just, you know, I like your hair. I just never touched it before. Um, and then you have a word for them in your head, and you're just like, I want to let them know that this is not right. But there's a way to call them in instead of calling them out. So unfortunately, we're in the job of education, even when we didn't sign up to be school teachers. Any school teachers in the, in the place? Well, come on now. OK, you guys are going to educate us because we need help. Because it's difficult. It's very difficult to try to educate someone on the spot when they've hurt you. right? Very difficult to educate somebody when they have played towards a certain role that you've known your entire life. And that happens in interviews. right? There's phone calls. There's pronunciation of names. There's perceived genders. Um, and that hurts when you get things wrong or when you say things that are offensive. Well, where are you from? And I tell you Monterey, because I'm from Monterey. Well, where are you really from? <laughs> I said I was from Monterey. <sighs> Didn't you watch Big Little Lies? You know what happens when you don't <laughs> get the answer right? So 
in calling people in, we have to know how we're going to do it, how we're going to say it. Another step that we want to take is obviously being aware of our own biases, being aware of our own privileges, being aware of the stereotypes that we perpetuate. And that's in and out of work, right? I can watch this really funny comedy on Netflix that has full of racist and sexist connotations all by myself in my house or with my closest friends who all look like me, but you know, I'm down for the cause, right? I'm down to do diversity, equity, and inclusion, but in my house I want to watch this program that really does nothing to get to not being racist, great, but it does nothing to get to actually be anti-racist or anti-sexist. And to get to the anti, it takes action and advocacy. It takes you in the private moments in your home or with your closest friends challenging them, challenging your family at the Thanksgiving table, um, but don't challenge your mama. The other step is we want to build significant relationships with those who don't look like, act like, behave like, come from um, places that we come from, right? Diversity is so incredibly important, and we know that inclusion is not a natural consequence of diversity, so how then can we make those who we're interacting with feel like they want to be around us? Um, what are some ways that you feel comfortable uh, when being around people who you aren't necessarily around? Is it food? Is it a little bit of drink? Is it a conversation about something that you share in common? Like, I don't know where all the human race and climate change is coming, y'all. It's already here. Maybe we can talk about those, those things to get closer to who we are. So I live in San Francisco, and this is some data from 2011 and 2000 to 2015. The numbers are way off now because you've got to make $3 billion to have a one-bedroom <laughs> um, apartment in San Francisco. So I feel really bad right now for the white men who are at $104,000 now. They're poor in San Francisco. I don't know how they're making it. So back in 2011, 2015, this diagram is showcasing exactly where people of color are falling in San Francisco. And truly, in the Bay Area, they're falling out of it. Um, how many folks live in the Bay Area? All right. And how many folks of color live in San Francisco who raised their hand? All right, one person, I got to get you, got to take me to lunch. <laughs> in San Francisco, you know what I'm saying? I, I had to live in Vallejo because I cannot afford um, San Francisco, but I could afford the very expensive ferry ride to get to work and the wine on the way back from work <laughs> when I'm done. But when we think about intersectionality from Kimberly Crenshaw and we think about black and black women making this amount of money to travel to work, right? Because no black women who said they lived in San Francisco in this room, um, or said they lived in the Bay Area, live in San Francisco. And to make $29,000 is just insane, right? And why is that the case? It's because of systemic and institutionalized racism. Racism that we need to call out by name and we need to actively destroy. Dismantle, step on it with your shoe, and walk away in high heels like Beyonce. So this illustration I really love because I hate running. And I would never do this like this white man who has to jump over these hurdles. I think it's a lot because I don't want to do it. But then I look over here and on an equity lens. I see, yeah, they're, they're starting at the same point. And everybody's like, OK, that's great equality. They're starting at the same point, you guys. Great. No, she's got to jump over alligators, y'all, and barbed wire. I don't know what those Game of Thrones stakes are in the back. <laughs> and then she's got a wall to get over, too. So when we're talking about this, we have to put an equity lens on it, too, to know that those who intersect in different diverse demographics have further obstacles than we may have. As a male, I probably would, you know, gay male, hey, I probably would not have the barbed wire um, and I don't want the alligator, so I'm just probably going to jump over it. But I still have some hurdles compared to other people. But I'm in a better situation because of institutionalized discrimination against women and black women than black women because of my privilege of being a male. We all have privileges because of these society norms. And this will showcases all of those privileges that intersect. It also talks about various oppressions and resistance that exist at the same time. But it's important that we take this will and we, oh, I love the cameras. Everybody said, can we email them this? <laughs> yeah. 
But it's important that we look at this will, understand where we fit in, right? It is important for you not just to feel guilty all the time and I'll never get this work done, no matter what race, color, creed, sexual orientation, different ability you are, it feels impossible to get this work done because the work really isn't getting done in our society on an institutional or systemic way. But recognize that you too have areas where you are oppressed and you too have areas where you showcase privilege. So what would you want done in areas where you feel oppression by those who have privilege? If we think about that in everything that we do, it would change our mindset. It would change, I think, some of the outcomes. In the initial clip that we did by uh, Beyonce from Netflix in her homecoming tour, Maya Angelou talked in the beginning. Can anybody remember what Maya Angelou said? You better. Say it louder. She said, tell the truth, right? And that's first to yourself. And I think that's who we're having the problem. We want our organizations to tell us everything about diversity, equity, inclusion. We want our ERG leaders to be like, hey, we solved everything for you. It is our work first to ourselves, right, then to others. It is important that we own this work, even when we feel like we don't want to own it and we want to kick it to the curb. Nothing's going to change unless we have self-ownership, unless we tell the truth first to ourselves. She also said that she wants to uh, be present um, in her race and in the human race. She wants to live every moment being kind. And what does that mean to be kind, right? I think it's something that we take incredibly for granted. And I'm this artsy guy who works for a ballet organization where people are always hugging and I'm like, don't touch me. Um, <laughs> but now it's rubbing off and I'm like, would you like a welcome hug? Because that's my, that's my lawyer mentality. I'm like, no. Not today, <laughs> to not have a welcome hug for everybody. But the work is going to be so important for us to remember to be kind, be kind to ourselves and be kind to others and really define what that means. So this will is going to be important for us to use in our day to day lives in and out of work. So now I want to get into a DEI formation. Um, how many of you got to go on Beyonce's tour when she did the formation tour, the Lemonade tour? Okay. You went? Yeah. Why you didn't take me? <laughs> so that was a phenomenal concert. She's absolutely amazing. She can perform herself off. But we remember the performance from that little tiny game, the Super Bowl. Um, I don't watch the stuff, okay? But I did watch in which Beyonce was performing. <laughs> and she did like national black girl anthem when she came out hardcore. And she did a tribute to the Black Panthers. And she had all of her black brothers and sisters out there dancing and Bruno Mars. And <laughs> <laughs> Bruno Mars, he was holding it down. We love him. Um, but it was important because she used such a platform, right, to do something scary. Uh, the last black woman to get up there and do something scary that she didn't even do, it was Justin. Uh, what happened to her, right? This, truly, we don't ever want to be like, well, she rich, she can solve everything, she got kids, she named them weird names, and that's just like, what? But she's actually a human who decided to make a conscious decision in her work, in her livelihood, to take a risk, right? Who's ever been at the Super Bowl and worn Black Panther garments? gave a tribute to them, and said, I like hot sauce in my bag, swag. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's done that before, but in our jobs, we have to take those risks too. Um, and we're going to get into risk taking a little bit later, but it is incredibly important. I know we got to get our paycheck. I know we have to pay our bills. I know our bosses have certain expectations for us, and our companies do too. Your expectations for yourselves are more important. So in this work, you will fail. That's all right. Keep on grinding, right? Look at her fall. Eh! <laughs> I'm sorry, B. And then he comes out like, hey. <laughs> so <laughs> look, I want to go back to this. 
In this work, we already know that we've, we've failed a ton. We know we failed in our society. We know big government has failed in our society. We know the history that has come upon us after 400 years of slavery. Um, we're still failing. But that doesn't mean we give up, right? Who's gonna, do you want to give up? You didn't come here to give up, right? You came here to dance Beyonce. And that's all right. It is so incredibly important that we pick ourselves up and we figure out how to move on to the next step with community, um, with engaging with each other, uh, and with remembering why we started the work in the first place. And that's difficult to do in real time, but call me. I'm going to leave my business cards up here. I'm going to give you a reality check and then check in on your boom, boom, cat dance moves from Beyonce so we can keep grinding together. So those of you who didn't get to go on Beyonce's tour, you probably saw her Lemonade-like strategic album that came out that was phenomenal, right? Formation is the last song of the album that really is truly inspiring, but all the songs leading up to it aren't only about her personal life and her relationships as a black woman, they're about her personal relationships with society as a black woman, right? So she's mad. There's anger in that. Um, and there's a stereotype around black women being angry. And I get why we would be angry, and we should be angry for black women to have to deal with the amount of oppression that they have to deal with, um, the amount of pay that they receive and compared to their white brothers and sisters and other races, um, where they have to live the judgment, the stereotypes, the consistent having to correct other people for the actions that they're doing, not the actions that the black woman herself is doing. It gets tiring, right? And we don't stop to call that out and think about it and think about our own personal responsibility in making every environment inclusive of black women. And I really do strongly think that if we build programs around how we encourage include, provide a psychologically safe place and an income that is reflective of that psychologically safe place for black women, we will touch every other intersecting group. I strongly believe it if we start with black women. Maybe because my mother is a black woman and I'm tired of her being discriminated against, but it's also because I believe it's the right way to go. Um, in a way that we're not currently thinking about. I think we're thinking about let's hit every area of diversity and we're doing, uh, for lack of a better word, half-ass job at it, right? Because we're trying to hit 27,000 intricate areas of diversity and we're not hitting one effectively. So I really strongly believe, oh, is that a picture? <laughs> so, <laughs> I gotta make sure you guys are still awake. So in getting into a DEI mindset, I want to ask you guys to think about mindfulness, um, how we practice mindfulness. There are going to be a couple of sessions on mindfulness, so I won't go too deep into the theory and the practice. But I want to ask you just to jot down, if you've got pen and paper, three words. Um, three words that when you die, you want to be remembered for. Go ahead and take the time to write those down. Not when you win the lotto, but when you're dead and gone. Who's brave? Who can come to this microphone right now? I welcome you to say what you want to be remembered for. And tell us your name. Tell us your favorite Beyonce song. OK. Hi, everybody. My name is Iman. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, whoop, whoop. <laughs> of course. Um, my favorite Beyonce song honestly probably is formation because it is really impactful um, considering the climate and when I think about my own experiences. So that's probably the favorite one. Um, and my three words that I'd like to be remembered by once I'm deceased are creative, thoughtful, and happy. Creative, thoughtful, and happy. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Creative, thoughtful, and happy. Anybody else want to come to the microphone? Because it's going to be filmed. In case anything happens on this trip, at least they're going to get it back to your family. <laughs> Um, my name is Sharita, and my favorite song, I love all of Beyonce. I, I'll take it back to Survivor, which is not necessarily her song, but... It was her. She kicked everybody exactly. out anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, the three words I chose were um, loving, generous, and a believer. Loving, generous, and a believer. You better work. 
One more person. Anybody feeling brave? The microphone? I'm going to do two more because I just, I did this motion that invited people, so <laughs> I'm going to do two. Hi, I'm Linda. I'm also from San Francisco. Come on, buy me lunch. All right, all right we'll do that. We'll do that. I'll get your number after. Um, my favorite song right now is Irreplaceable because I've been dating, so. Irre <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, hold on. My that made me words. speechless. That's hard to do. <laughs> my three words are compassionate, vibrant, and brave. Compassionate, vibrant, and brave. Amazing, amazing. Hello. I'm Jasmine. Um, my favorite song is Sorry, because as a woman, we always say sorry, right? So I need to just say sorry, not sorry. I'm not sorry. Um, so my three words are Latina. I want to be remembered because I'm so proud to be a Latina woman. Um, empath, I'm a very empathetic person. I think most women are. And a storyteller because I'm a writer. Come on. Now, when you say storytelling, that's like I'll go on a whole nother tangent. I'm going to make you stand there for a minute and talk to you. <laughs> storytelling is so incredibly important. And claiming back the narrative of our own story is very important. Um, I'll, I talk about it every single day and ballet, right? Because it's like Romeo and Juliet and like Nutcracker, and they're all phenomenal, but they all feel like you're telling the same story about the same particular homogenous group, and I'm tired of hearing about them and their family. I want to change the narrative. I want to change what the narrative looks like. I want to change what the narrative feels like. I want to change. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. Now, the reason I had that example is because if you're being mindful and you're truly being mindful every day, then you're living every day like it's your last. And you're living every day where each of your points, you're being creative, you're storytelling, you're being brave, you're being courageous, you're being um, direct, whatever it may be, you're living that life consistently every day. You're having to think about that though, which is difficult, right? Because nobody wants to wake up in the morning like, eh, it's going to be my last day. So let me just think about all these things that I want to be and prove to myself before I kick the bucket that I'm going to be those things. So I urge you, instead of thinking you're proving it to yourself, just think you're trying to live it for yourself. No proof necessary, no judgment necessary, right? Because they're internal, uh, at least for those who didn't share it on the microphone, for the rest of you, I'm going to call you if I find out it's not trying to be at your funeral. You also, we talked about this earlier, we want to take risk. Um, and that means sometimes putting our jobs on the line. And that is difficult to do. Those of us that work in diversity, equity, and inclusion space, your job's on the line every single day. Um, because you can say the right thing, I'm gonna say the right thing, okay? Not the wrong thing, but you're saying it to a person who's not quite on the journey that you're on at a different starting point, and that can truly end your job, right? To call somebody in about their racism who ranks you in power dynamic and hierarchy is hard. It's difficult, but it is so incredibly important because you still have privileges, right? And we need to exercise those privileges, and that means taking a risk. And I think that is one of the biggest points that we as leaders in organizations and in society aren't doing. We're expecting others to take the risk for us, but we're not doing it ourselves because in taking a risk means I ain't got no job, my kids aren't gonna have any shoes, I don't know what I'm gonna do, they can ruin my career, I don't wanna talk that way to my mother-in-law. Shout out to my mother-in-law, I love you. Um, but don't get crazy. And then, <laughs> but there's so many risks in confronting whatever the ism or the phobia is. But I encourage you to be brave and to take those risks in a way that calls people in instead of calling them out um, because we're never going to move to that flawless area of diversity, equity, and inclusion if we wait for somebody else. So let's bring it home. You all saw homecoming, right? OK, so you all know the dance routine. I need to five, six, seven, eight, so you guys will come out here and do this. Are you ready? Who's going to dance it? OK, nobody's going to dance it. In talking about our DEI homecoming, I'm going to rush through a couple of slides because I want to talk more with you and hear from you. But I mainly want to focus on being an ally. So I want you to watch this, and I have some well, questions I have a for you. Story, and you guys are going to be the first to hear it. Um, 
About 15 months ago, Jessica Jastain, uh, we're really good friends, and we had such a great time working on The Help. Uh, she wants to do comedies, and I want to break out of period pieces. So uh, <laughs> I love them. They look kind to me. But I kind of want to play someone who resembles me in some fashion. Um, and uh, so she contacted me, and she said, I want us to do a comedy. And I'm like, yeah. And uh, it, you know, she had an idea, and um, she went off to work, I went off to work. Um, she called me maybe six months later, which would have been uh, like last March. And we were talking about pay equity and uh, with men and women. And she was like, it's time that women get paid the same as men. I'm like, yeah, Jessica, it's time. <laughs> and you know, we were you, dropping F-bombs and you know, getting it all out there. And then I said, but here's the thing, women of color on that spectrum, we make far less than white women. So we're gonna have that conversation about pay equity. We gotta bring the women of color to the table. And I told her my story and we talked numbers and she was quiet and she had no idea that that's what it was like for women of color. And so she said, I'm probably gonna cry. I don't know, these are happy tears. I love that woman because she's walking the walk and she's actually talking the talk. She said, Octavia, we're going to get you paid on this film. I said, I, I would love to do your film, but here's the thing. I'm going to have to get paid. And then <laughs> she said, we're, of course, and you and I are going to be tied together. We're going to be favorite nations, and we're going to make the same thing. And you're going to make that amount. And fast forward to last week, we're making five times what <laughs> we asked for. Yeah. Jessica Chastain. So in that video, tell me what you noticed specifically about Jessica Chastain when it comes to being an ally. Brave people can come to the mic or if you feel more comfortable shouting out, cool, I can repeat. When she said like, your responsibility to bring others along. So when you have privilege, it's your responsibility to bring others along. Right, action. You have to do more than saying you care about it. You actually have to do what, come on, you tied it into my whole thing from the beginning. <laughs> action and advocacy. I was just gonna say, you have to seek out information. Like, she didn't know. Um, and it's no longer okay not to know. You know that still doesn't matter. Exactly. She specifically used a term I love, Google that shit. <laughs> she said, <laughs> She said, it's, it's done. It was the warning that we provided earlier. It's done with the, I don't know, and I'm and not acting. Google that shit. You have to get the knowledge, and then you have to act on the knowledge that you have. Right, because she's still a woman working in an industry that are dominated at the top by men, typically white men. And Jessica said, I'm still going to be an ally to my girl who deserves, at the very least, the same rate of pay as me, which is a huge and incredible risk. I think you guys have got all those points. I've got another video to show you, and then I have some questions about that. Everybody that's outside this building, that's homeless, have been nothing but neglected and disrespected by your coward. I believe this. You know what I'm saying? You was a coward. Yep. I sat there and I read Sacramento B and you talk about all these millions and millions of dollars, right? That's what you talk about, And you'll about, hear right? some of the beeping as it goes, but this is important because this is a black man who has now witnessed yet right? another black life right. taken by the hands of police officers. You know what? You know what? Yes, that you know what Let's be, let's, let's keep this real. Why have nobody?
That is very difficult to watch, right? That hurts, that's painful, but that's incredibly a real experience for brown and black bodies and lives, um, at the very least in this country. But what we saw was somebody who was very angry about the situation that they are forced to live in and deal with in everyday life, having to tell their children how they behave to and in front of police officers, what they say to certain people. And in this, at a city council meeting, this was a constituent of the city council expressing his thoughts about that police force. It's but beyond right. him. Only one. Oh, I like that. Thanks. Um, but beyond that, thank you. Beyond that, we saw allies, right? I'm not asking you to physically go and surround yourselves around imminent danger and violence. Awesome if you do, because we need you as allies, definitely. What I'm asking you is to surround yourself um, and others by being an effective ally, by showing up, by being present, by knowing what it takes to be what someone else needs. I think that is incredibly important. And I've not seen that amount of braverism in any other work stream, any other company, but I see it right there in community. So there is something that community is doing right that we need to figure out how we get it done in our workplaces. So yes, I work for San Francisco Ballet. Um, San Francisco Ballet, don't be upset with me because I'm going to play this video after I ask um, some more questions about this video and a couple of people. Anybody else see anything in this video that jumped out to them? Right. Right. Thank you for being, no, no, thank you for being open with that. I think that's important. So she's from Australia and she's come to the States many times, but she sees the constant amount of homelessness and the homelessness that are affecting Right. We desensitize, right? We turn off our minds when we walk by folks in the street because we don't want to engage. We don't want that community. We don't want it if we are really being real and calling it out by name. And we feel powerless. We're like, well, how can we help? So then we just choose to ignore it. That's what I see as a societal issue, but that I think one that we can actually affect by speaking, by talking, you know, hello, good morning. It's OK to talk. Um, that was really good. I really appreciate that. That's, no, that's really good. I like that perspective. If I can have everybody stand up. I have very much enjoyed my time with you. We're going to open it up for questions in a minute. But I have some questions for you. If you have not heard of this, then you can sit down. Um, but if you have, I want you to stay standing. If you know these names, something I also got from my hero, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, but Jazeline Ware, if you know the name, stay standing. If you don't know the name, sit down. Malaysia Booker. Sanal Lindsay. I have about 22 more names to get to. Um, but each of these names are slain black transgender women in the last seven months that we don't know. We don't, we, we stopped at three. They have names, they have an experience that's important and we may not be able to see how that intersects with our work stream, but you all have personal lives. And unfortunately or fortunately, we will spend most of our time working. We also want to bring in that personal aspect. I want to encourage you to get into formation in a Beyonce formation and figure out how you bring your personal side to your working professional lives to know every name that's important and that's black and that's transgender and no longer with us. I thank you all for your time. I'm out of time. If you have questions, let me know I'm here and I'll play a video so my company feels really happy. <laughs> It's 
to my girl, Lauren. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. There's any questions? Sorry, LinkedIn. <laughs> any questions? Maybe we want to use the mic so everybody can hear. Oh, right now I'm reading this book and apologize for not knowing the name, but it's one of the reasons that I'm um, talking about this particular topic of not only not being racist, but getting to anti-racist. And it's called How to Be an Anti-Racist. I think everybody should read it. Of course, I read my cousin's book recently, Becoming, because she's going to be here, so I read your book. Um, and then I stay up on a lot of Kimberly Crenshaw and anything from Bell Hooks. And I may disagree with things that they say sometimes, very rarely, but I think that's important, how we get to actually a point where we can read something and disagree with some of the things, but how we um, actually begin to change mindset. Good question. Mm. One of the suggestions that was very strong was the white workforce and just the community and um, the need to kind of add to your social as well as um, your time branding. But um, are there any thought leaders that you could, that you, other than just being a general thought leader, but like um, thought leaders that you could recommend on giving a social platform for our employees to not engage with, but listen to? Yeah. Um. I barely use Facebook anymore, but Facebook has a great platform around diversity, equity, and inclusion that they provide free to anybody who wants it. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of in-person. I just feel like you get a better reaction. It's more real. But if you don't want to pay for some of the training and see the thought leaders, you can see a bunch of them um, on Facebook's platform. You can also see a bunch on TED Talks as well. I will keep saying Kimberly Crenshaw's name. She's an academic, but she's just a phenomenal human being. And I think that if you can get Kimberly to come in, if you can get Angela Davis to come in, if you can get Beyonce Knows Carter to come in, <laughs> that is really going to have an effect, I think, on your workplace. But even more importantly is management training, right? People don't leave their jobs for the most part. They leave their bosses because their bosses are, you can fill in the blank. Um, and managers, bosses need training. And not just training that they get to go to and sign a nice little statement to say that they went, but they need to tie it to their performance plan. So you did this, you're not getting paid. You do this, that's one issue, and guess, you do it again, you need to be gone. The same consequences that employees feel like, if I don't do this, if I don't behave this way, I'm going to be canned, is the same thing that needs to happen for higher ups. Thank you. 